Hmm. I don't know. It does? Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Tomasz, I'm from Budapest and it's really nice that you guys invited me to speak. And just a few words about me because, you know, nobody's interested but I am. <laughs> so uh, I, I work at a company called Secret Source Partners. We are a San Francisco based company but we are entirely operated out of Budapest so there is no one in the US. Um, and we, we have an e-commerce solution for, it's based on <laughs> it's based on data uh, data mining and we have a product called fit predictor and we s if you buy apparel online we tell you how big the like how which size you should pick the, basically that's what we do and we have a lot of machinery behind the scenes and I'm going to talk about uh, Kafka and some go as well <laughs> but it's mostly Kafka so this is the agenda. Okay, I, don't, I cannot see my screen, but it's fine. Um, and I'm gonna talk first about what, what is Kafka and how it works and, and uh, why is it good and why should you use it. And then I'm going to talk about a, how to use it from Go. It's pretty simple, so it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be the most interesting part of the talk, but, and then uh, a few things that about how we use it and how we came to the decision that Kafka is the best approach for us. So what is Kafka? And in the docs, the first sentence basically says that Kafka is a distributed partition replicated commit log service, but that's a really fancy way of saying that it's a first in first out queue, basically. And you just push messages into it and it comes out at the other end. And this, it's really, really simple. And it has, like any other messaging system, it has producers and consumers and it sit, sits in between. And you just, you know, push in messages and read it out on the other end. It's, it's nothing really magical. And, it's, uh, and it has less features than other messaging services. Like, and uh, less features is actually a feature because it's, we can call it dumb actually, because it's just, it's a glorified TCP stream, but it's, it's really, it's really much more, but from the user's perspective, it's really easy to use. And it has topics for maintaining uh, a feed of messages. We will look into how topics work a little bit. And it was uh, originally developed by LinkedIn. And they are not just producing emails, they actually do some <laughs> actual <laughs> development. And this is a really, really great tool. They are using it for everything. And the, the capabilities, the performance capabilities of Kafka is, is uh, actually unbelievable and I will uh, go into some details but we are running a single node and we never hit the uh, performance uh, like barrier or like we never had any problems with performance yet and but high availability is a must so you should run at least three nodes but running one is, is a, just a yes yeah, so is it any good and obviously it is. I'm not gonna talk about something that's not good. And I had a few notes, but <laughs> I just lost it. Uh, I have to remember why is it good. <laughs> no, I, I know what it's. Uh, so message queues are an easy way to organize your system. So there is a, everybody's talking about microsystem or microservices and stuff and everybody, every service talks to an, every other service and it's a huge mess, but with a message broker in the middle, you can clean it up easily. And yeah, mm, I need my notes. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Mm, I think it. I don't know. Maybe. Whatever. <laughs> I cannot make it work. It's too technical for me, you know. Uh, <laughs> so why is why is it good? It's easy to reason about, and there's a really good library support. That, like I, and so let's dive into it. And I talked about microservices. 
We have a few, but like we are not at Uber Scaleware or Uber, I don't know how to pronounce it. They have like thousands of microservices, but we have a few. But and that's from a LinkedIn uh, presentation that J Krebs did, I think. And they had this architecture before introducing Kafka. So I've, that's what I told you. It's a mess. Everybody talks to everybody. There is no. No, I should maybe if I stand up. <laughs> you see better. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so and this is this is a typical microservice thing that that's a that's an I, I don't know a, a, pr a pretty common difficulty that you hit if you have uh, enough services, but if you introduce Kafka, then you can clean it up really easily because you you have a single point, then every data can go through, and it decouples everything. The uh, the producers doesn't have to know about the consumers and, and vice versa. And it's not HTTP because HTTP is synchronous by nature and it's really hard to get it working asynchronously. So, and this is by nature asynchronous. So you don't have to worry about when the request comes back. If you have a, an expensive computation, for example, we are doing some image processing and that takes a few minutes per image because it's not yet optimized. So that's not really fit into a, a request time. And with this, with Kafka, you can just uh, put it in the middle and every can, everything can go through it. And there are like really good tooling for it. So if you wanna dump all the logs from, the, from Kafka to, um, to a database or to Hadoop or whatever, you don't have to write any custom code, just run another service and it reads from uh, from the topic that you pointed to and saves it to Hadoop or I don't know, whatever you are using, any analytics tool or. And the other uh, really nice thing about this is that um, if you have a new idea for a, how to process data or how, for example, if you have a clickstream data and user and you are recording all the clicks on the site and you find a new way to analyze them, you don't have to cram it into your existing application, you can just pin up a new one and, and it can process all the logs from the beginning. And that's, uh, that's the persistent part of Kafka and that comes really handy if you, if you introduce something new to the system. Um, so how does it work from a user's perspective? Uh, I thought I already mentioned that it's pretty easy to use, but and the concepts are really, really easy to grasp. But basically, there are three things here, and you have topics. That's the main organizing point. Basically, you say that I have uh, page views, and I have transactions, and I have view cards, items, and whatever you want to organize them, and and. Uh, you just push uh, messages to it, and every topic can have multiple partitions, and partitions are the unit of parallelization. So for example, if you have a topic with 32 partitions, then you can have 32 separate consumers working on those partitions and doing actual parallel work on different servers without any coordination from your part. And, uh, and um, the offset, is basically a unique ID on the on the log, so it starts from zero and it's always incrementing, and that's how you can resume consum uh, uh, the consumer. So if you if your consumer crashes, it it doesn't have to start from the beginning; it can start from where it left off, and that's that's really nice. But as I said, it's it's dumb, and it and it was even dumber be before uh, the 0 0.9 release. We are using the 0.8 release, and it is it is hard on the client side. So, the server really did really was a, a glorified TCP, TCP stream. So it didn't, really didn't offer anything beyond uh, you can connect to it and read messages. And we had two con uh, type of consumers. The one was the simple one that was provided by all the drivers that you can find and you had to specify which topic, which partition you read, and which offset to start from. That's not really a nice experience for the developers. But there is another obstruction called consumer groups, and uh, those manages uh, these things. So you can group together a few consumers and say that these eight consumers working on the same topic, and they 
they share the partitions and they uh, they do uh, what do I call it. Uh, so they agree on who's who's uh, consuming which partition, and that was uh, that was all done by the client. So this, uh, the server, the Kafka server, actually did nothing for you. You have to figure out a way to store the uh, offsets and store, um, or you do the rebalancing. And uh, actually, a Zookeeper was used for it. Kafka is a, is not a like a whole solution, but Kafka is a part of the thing, and it uses Zookeeper for metadata and uh, and um, and other like uh, to lead for leader election and all the um, like all the hard parts of the distributed thing. And the Kafka actually just uh, focuses on uh, storing and reading the messages. And and in the uh, new release. Uh, the 0.9, they uh, recognize that it's really hard for the community to come up with uh, with really good clients, and so they took it uh, on the over the server side. So now you can just send a few messages, and you can join groups, and it's all managed for you. Basically, that's a that's a nicer experience for the library developers. And um, in the message format, it. When I said it's dumb, and it, I, I meant it because it, it's a byte stream basically, and it and it has nothing to do with your application. You can choose whatever you want, and the the common wisdom is that you should choose something that has structure. So if you just push strings into it, then that's not really uh, a good. Maybe it's a, I don't know. It's not a really good solution or not a a scalable solution. So what what they say is that you should push at least JSON because it's semi-structured, but that then um, you can bump into backward compatibility issues then because it's persistent. So from the beginning of the time, it it, uh, uh, it stores your messages. And uh, even if a new consumer joins and reads all the messages, then it, they can differ. And that's why they uh, Um, sorry, uh, they, what's the word? Uh, they advise to have something like a, a proper schema in place, and there is a, a few uh, protocol, or not protocols, but technologies like Avro and protocol buffers and Thrift that offer this a lot more, but these are the most well known, and um, Avro is, that is uh, the proposed solution from the from Confluent, that's the company behind Kafka right now. It's not LinkedIn anymore. They created a new company for it, and they and Avro is is a serialization format, and you can have schemas and and a schema registry, so you don't have to put the schema in the message, and it's binary, so the messages can be smaller, because with JSON the messages are quite big. It always includes the keys and stuff, but Actually, Kafka has a has a solution for that too. It can do uh, lock compaction, and it can do uh, lock compaction is when you push messages into it, and it's the same message. Every message has a key, so it's easy to distinguish. Or it's easy to tell which message is the same, and it can all. And when you do lock compaction, lock compaction, then it keeps only the the last message, basically, the the most recent one, and. You can use some compression as well. So when you push a lot of messages, usually uh, you do batch batches. That's how you can keep up a, a good throughput and performance. And you just compress all the matches, messages and, and and Kafka stores it that way. And it never looks into the message. So the contents of the messages is not really uh, it, it means nothing to Kafka. Actually, in the new release, the the uh, zero point ten, that's the it just came out a few weeks ago. They actually managed to get compression and log compaction to work together. That wasn't the case before, so that's a that's a nice uh, feature. And so let's take a look at how to use uh, Kafka from Go. And um, there is a a single library. Actually, uh, there may, might be more, but there is a Sarama from Shopify. They 
they posted it and it's and it's really great. It works great and it and it's been stable for us for a year or more, and I never had problems with it. So I just stick with that. And uh, Sonoma is actually uh, the driver, so it's really low level. It has uh, on the producer side, it's it's fully functional. So in this uh, in this uh, um, is this it? Ah, oh, nice. Uh, so we, we can see that we have the async producer. It just you can push messages into it, and it keeps them in memory. And sometimes it pushes out. So every few seconds, or when you reach a certain batch size, and you don't have to care about it because it, it's abstracted away. And you just read the errors out. And this is this is a quite a strange, I think, a strange API here uh, that. They are, they are using channels. Uh, that's not really usual. Like, like idiomatic can go, they usually hide channels behind the scenes, but they actually embraced it and put it in front of you. So this is just how you push out some messages. And one other thing that the leaders, and uh, because it's distributed, you have to have a leader because you, know, it's, you cannot just write to any, uh, or any broker. But you have to pick a leader, and it's by partition, so actually you can have multiple leaders at the same time, and and it's also uh, like abstracted away. And the partition that you are pushing to, it's not here. It's it's figured out behind the scenes. If you if you don't configure anything, then it's usually a, a random partition that it chooses. But you can you can override it, and you can maintain that. With the same key, it goes to the same uh, same partition. That that's a nice feature if you need like locality and maybe want to get rid of uh, race conditions. I had some uh, troubles with that. So this is the producer side, and the consumer side is is the same. Not actually not the same, but the API is really, really similar. So you just have the consumer, and you pass in the brokers. And then you create a, a consumer for the partition. You have to say the, the topic name and the partition number and where should it start. So this is the, the low, level, uh, low level consumer where you have to specify everything and nothing is done for you basically. And if you want to use like if you want to use this, then then you need to do a lot of coordination. So in actual code, this is this is what. Uh, what I use, it's for it's another library uh, from it. I don't know. Where, maybe this guy works at Shopify, Shopify as well, but I'm I don't know. But he's he's written uh, he's working with this library and Zookeeper as well. So he has I, yeah he has some nice libraries. You should check it out. And so a consumer group that I mentioned is basically just a, a group of consumers, and it, they have uh, some. Uh, orchestration between them, so I can just say that these eight consumers working on the same topic and and they don't read all like the messages are distributed between them, so you can you can uh, process them parallelly. And this is basically the same as the the previous one, just not a partition consumer. You create a, a consumer group and then just read the messages out of a, a channel and. Basically, that's it. So super easy to use the libraries, and everything is is happening behind the scenes. So how we use it? Um, we have, as I mentioned, we have a single node. That's not ideal. It was a, a proof of concept implementation that stuck around for a little while, um, and we have a handful of topics. Not, met, but we are planning to move more things to Kafka and planning to scale this part of the uh, system. Uh, we have uh, actually the data pipeline that we call it the data pipeline that's too generic. So basically, the, the feeds that we are getting from our customers, we have product feeds and transactions transaction feeds uh, that we use for the uh, size prediction algorithm, and we process these uh, via Kafka. So we just dump a whole uh, dump a, a file line by line into Kafka, and every line is a message. And then we have a, a message a product consumer that processes these messages, does some uh, cleanup and 
and stores it in a format that uh, our system can understand. And then the downstream systems, Fitprinter is uh, the main product that we have, is consumes the messages, stores it, and then can operate on them. And the other one is uh, StyleFinder, that's, uh, that's the new product that we are working on. It's based on image recognition, but uses the same data. So we didn't have to write any, like we could reuse everything that we wrote up until that point. We just had to create a new consumer and it was done. Mm. And I put some links here uh, that may, might be interesting. That that's the uh, LinkedIn presentation a few from a few years back, and I stole the, the images from there. And there is a really interesting uh, a blog post on how Heroku um, performance did the performance test for their Kafka. Uh, like they offer Kafka now as a, a managed service and they performance tested it and they found some interesting things and they couldn't actually uh, like saturate the CPU and the disk, but it was the network that broke down at the end. So they had that, that's just how well Kafka is like architected and works that you cannot kill the process. The hardware breaks down first. Um, and that was basically all that I got. So if you have any questions, I'll yeah? So when you use that second library there, uh, do you need to talk about the details? Like how, how does it know? Oh, yeah. Um, it yeah, it's, uh, as I mentioned, the Zookeeper is, a, is the like that's the complementary system that you use. You have to run a Kafka cluster and a Zookeeper cluster, so it's actually two clusters, but you can run them side by side. And Kafka stores every metadata in Zookeeper, so you can reach it through Kafka mostly, but it, you can just reach into uh, Zookeeper and read it. And this library actually stores uh, the uh, Kafka consumer group library actually stores everything in Zookeeper, so all the offsets and which consumers are active and, and actually uses Zookeeper for the rebalancing. So when a consumer uh, joins or leaves the group, you have to rebalance the partitions. So if a new one joins, then you have to you know, give partitions to the new consumer. If one leaves, then you have to, like the partitions owned by that consumer, they should be again picked up so and that uses uh, zookeeper for that so there is no coordination it that zookeeper has some nice uh, primitives for distributed systems yep uh, yeah it, it could be but what they usually do is that uh, you just mark an offset uh, committed and then it sometimes flushes it so it, it's again not every message that you uh, so it's not it doesn't go to uh, zookeeper every time you commit but it commits the messages like every I don't know 30 seconds or something or if you reach if you process a few thousand messages then it commits it but yeah that zookeeper can be a, a bottleneck if you yes Yeah, so uh, that's a good question, and we. Okay. Yeah, so the problem that we tried to solve is our first data pipeline was basically like doing some bash magic on files and dumping them to Mongo. That that was that was even bolder, I think. So um, and then we um, figured out that this is not a good way to go. And then we had some, I don't know, I had other tries, but we ended up with, we should go with a message broker because that solves a lot of problems for us. And then we looked at a few of them and Kafka seemed like a good one. So we, like, we, didn't, have, uh, we didn't have any experience with message brokers before. So RabbitMQ would have been the same risk for us as Kafka. And Kafka, I know it's a new one and, and it's an upcoming uh, technology, but it showed some great promise. And so we made a, a bet, basically, and it worked out. So, <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, luck. <laughs> yeah? I think, if I recall correctly, you said you are putting 500k messages through this every day? 
Yeah, that's n yeah, that's not much. So yeah. how much more would you be comfortable with you know, selling shares? A few million. Few million. Or more. I can. How it works is just it uses the uh, it pairs this everything to disk when it arrives to it, and it uses the uh, operating system's page cache. So it's really it it aggressively ca like the operating system aggressively caches the disk, and and it's in memory basically. So that's why it's fast, and the write performance is great because it just you know pushes it to the memory before the OS writes down to the disk. So the write performance is, is really really great. Uh, I think uh, I don't know. There is a, the where is a, I don't know where is this. Oh, so this says 3.5 million writes per second. That's what it was a few years ago. And LinkedIn runs. Uh, they have a, a 300 node Kafka broker like cluster. So they are doing it in a pretty big scale, and it works for them. Oh yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't actually related to the Kafka instance. But we are using it from Ruby as well, and and the uh, Ruby consumer implementation really sucks. <laughs> and uh, and it deadlocks basically. So what it does is when it cannot commit and rebalance at the same time because it uses a, a giant mutex to guard against this. And when a, a consumer goes down and it tries to rebalance, like and a new one comes up, because I don't know for whatever reason, then the new one cannot join the consumer group, and it constantly goes down because the processes, uh, the messages are being processed, and the rebalancing never happens. So sometimes we lose like partitions because of this. So like not not lose them, but they lag behind, and that's not really nice. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, Kafka is written in uh, Java or Scala. I don't know, but it runs on the JVM. And uh, the Java client is really, really great. It comes from the uh, same company that uh, builds Kafka. And for the service that we built in Go, it was, it was another experimentation to have, to try out Go for us, how it works for it, our use case. and. And basically, the concurrency support was the uh, the, the selling factor. But I, I think I'm out of time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everyone, uh, for listening. <laughs> and if you're more in interested, then come find me after the uh, talks. I will stick around. Thanks a lot, Tamas.